Hi, everybody. Nice to see you all. Get excited. The content is about to drop like it's hot. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you, Javier. My name is Vera Sacchetti, and I am a lecturer here at the department. Um, I am thrilled to introduce the first two speakers of the conference. We will start, as you have seen in the program, with a historical approach that takes us back in time, quite back in time. And our first lecturer, Efrazini Butsikas, is, as Roberto mentioned, not an architect by training. She's, in fact, a classical archaeologist who has also been a vice president of the European Society for Astronomy. So if this amazing background doesn't make you curious about her presentation, I don't know what will. Um, Efrazini Butsikas, uh, Dr. Butsikas, I should say, will be telling us about, uh, will be taking us back to ancient Greece, and it, she will be um, telling us a little bit more about how Greek temples um, were not originally intended for congregation, as we might uh, believe, um, and the idea that there was a cognitive importance to darkness and to shadows connected to um, understandings and experiences of uh, religion, the divine, and their interaction with monumental architecture. This will be followed by a presentation by Aleksandra Sumorok, who uh, joins us from Poland, um, where she's a professor at, uh, in Lodz. She'll be talking about social realist interiors. So from ancient Greece, we will leap forward quite a bit. Uh, towards um, socialist uh, Poland. And um, her lecture will then bring us uh, towards interiors, perhaps in a more, uh, in a more uh, objective way. Um, but this will also serve as kind of a lens to look towards um, other dimensions that we will be uh, looking at uh, in the continuation of the program. Uh, during this day. So without further ado, I will uh, pass it on to Zoom, where Dr. Butsikas is probably waiting for us. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Good. Um, thank you. Thanks very much for the introduction. Thank you very much to the conference organizers and to Roberto, special thanks for both the invitation, but also for accommodating all these last minute travel changes that were imposed on us. Um, the first thing that I wanted to say is um, that I'm really, really jealous of all of you being there and us being stuck here uh, in front of a camera, but um, there you have it. So my talk today, as you have already heard, will uh, introduce you to some examples of ancient Greek architecture um, as it was employed, uh, as it employed darkness, but it's, we're talking about monumental architecture, so not domestic function of architecture. Um, the first thing that I needed to do is to share my screen and my PowerPoint. So I'm going to have um, a shot at it now. Okay, so the reason why I'm focusing on monumental architecture today is because in antiquity, uh, the most impressive architectural forms were those of monumental architecture. And so um, because there were a lot of various people from back, various backgrounds gathering in these spaces, it is actually quite interesting to see how these spaces shaped perception and understanding, more so within the religious context because uh, within religion, uh, we have this ability to um, comprehend the world in a different way um, and for divinity to be revealed to people. So, as you heard, I usually work with dark skies um, and, uh, you know, external spaces and external religious spaces. But today is going to be very little on dark skies and much more on the internal darkness of some of these Greek spaces. To start with... Um, there, I just needed to go a little bit back, and although you already had this introduction and background that we are transforming, transporting ourselves into a time and space before modern concepts of darkness and light, um, 
I just also wanted to remind you that uh, we're dealing with spaces that were not illuminated, illuminated uh, by electricity. Uh, and this is a time where artificial br brightness was only achieved through a different means, the, the use of fire. So the power of fire in ancient civilizations and in ancient cultures was recognized from a very early stage of human development. Um, and this is not simply because ancient cultures were aware that humans were the only species able to use, create, harness fire, but also because um, ancient cultures, and especially ancient Greek culture that we will be dealing with today, um, they, the ancient Greeks recognized the unsurpassed power of fire because it allowed them to consume cooked food all of a sudden, uh, to create weapons, um, even to destroy landscapes and to destroy cities. But most importantly, on a cognitive level, fire allowed people to have to, to reverse, if you like, the natural course of night and uh, day. So they were now able, through the use of fire, to create light at night after the sun god Helios had, sent, had set in the west. But also they were able to reverse the effects of the seasons by being able to keep warm when the gods had decreed winter. So we are, as you can already understand, transporting ourselves into a time where um, absolutely everything was assigned divine will. And it was so empowering for people to be able to reverse these conditions and established by divinity. So it is not a surprise then that in Greek mythology, fire was a gift to mankind from the Titan God Prometheus, who actually was punished for this action for eternity. And until then, it was only gods who made use of fire. So only gods had the ability to create artificial illumination. And perhaps it is because of this belief that fire in antiquity and in ancient Greece was so closely associated with magic and divination and was extensively used um, in religious festivals in ancient Greece. So we learn of massive bonfires, altars being stacked with piles of wood and set on fire, living animals being thrown into the flames of great fires, nocturnal torch races, torch processions, dances with fire, and many other examples. In the earlier forms of ancient Greek temples, we have examples where a hearth was placed inside the temple and from at least the classical period onwards, we have several examples of temples housing eternal flames inside. And these flames, these fires, uh, burned during the, the day and night. In this context, within religion, even the movement of flames was perceived as a sign from, uh, div of divine presence. So the ability of fire to connect the human and the divine realms is witnessed further in the practice of empiromancy. This is the art of divination by fire. So in this practice, people would observe the movement of fire and the shape of the flames in order to foretell the future. So what, what we understand from all this is that fire in ancient Greece does not simply illuminate dark spaces. It does not simply destroy or create but it is also seen as the medium of communication between humans and the gods. Um, now, fire has a further cognitive importance. It makes our relationship with darkness much more intricate and much more intimate. So we have firelit spaces which are not washed in bright light in the way that modern, uh, modern spaces are when they're illuminated by electricity. And the flickering light of the torches or the oil lamps create a mystic atmosphere through the heavy shadows and the limited distance that light extends to. And of course, the ancient Greeks um, were well aware of this power of fire and they used it extensively in order to manipulate 
religious experience and the senses. So in this paper, I will be talking a, a lot about this uh, cognitive impact that the use of fire has in ancient Greek dark spaces. So we have examples of this taking place in the so-called ancient Greek mystery cults and in divination. Uh, an example is the Oracle of the Dead in Acheron, for instance, where the Oracle seeker, upon entering the oracular structure, would not see the light of day for several days. The only light that the consultant would witness um, would be uh, the light of torches and oil lamps. Similarly, uh, in the mystery cult of Eleusis at the Eleusinian Mysteries, we are told that revelation was taking place at night, so sacred objects were revealed to the participants inside the temple during consecutive alternations of bright light and darkness. So in ancient Greek religious, uh, religious experience, we find very commonly this polarity of light and darkness. And we will observe some of these examples today. Now, the importance of this polarity derives from the cosmogonic significance of darkness, which permeated the most significant events in human existence, birth and death. So these two major existential transitions bear direct light and darkness connotations. So we, they are characterized by symbolic and physical darkness. So we are born out of darkness into light. And at death, we move to eternal darkness. Religious rituals were framed by monumental architecture. And monumental architecture in modern and ancient societies around the world talks about inspiration, power, wealth, impact, political investment, um, as well as artistic achievement. So we could perceive monumental architecture as a mirror, uh, the mirror that a society stands in front, in front of day in and day out. So it's a reflection of the society that um, the society has chosen of itself and as a reflection that represents that society. In, ancient Greek, in the ancient Greek context, this mirror is also of deeper cultural and spiritual elements of the society. It stimulates deeper ind individual cognitive processes that express uh, cosmovision, uh, religious belief, and the comprehension of divinity. And fundamental to this process is the time of day or night these structures were experienced in antiquity and they became alive. So ancient Greek temple architecture controlled and guided the volume and direction of natural light through the use of doors, windows, and roof openings, thus satisfying specific needs for the illumination of spaces. This practice attests to the importance of darkness, shadow, and light effects in Greek religion. Sunlight admission was controlled th through the size and positioning of the windows and doors. In some cases, we have Greek temples that had more than two doors or more than one door. And that created a maximum visual impact when viewing the cult image of the god, which was placed inside the temple's interior. Um, we have variations in the depth and the width of the interior space and the size and the number of openings. And all this indicates that different trends were followed in different periods. So if we look at the earlier temples that were constructed in the seventh century BC, for example, they were long and narrow compared to those that were built about 500 years later in the second century BC. So later temples have a greater amount of natural light and admitted or that was admitted um, through larger window and door openings. Now this, in conjunction with the fact that temples were oriented at different directions, not just the east, indicates that general conclusions on the amount of light received inside Greek temples 
are not particularly meaningful. And instead, what we do need to do is to examine um, ancient Greek monumental architecture on a case by case. Archaeological finds um, have recovered also a number of lamps found both inside and outside the open space of the temples. Uh, so this attests to the extensive use of fire to illuminate these spaces. What is interesting is that we in modern day customarily experience these ancient spaces in daytime. So it is important to note that these spaces were constructed to be used equally at night as they were at, during the day. So let us start with a well-known site, a rather well-known site compared to the other sites that I will be talking about. Um, let's transport ourselves to Athens um, and have a look at the Athenian Acropolis. The most important festival of classical Athens was the Panathenaea. Uh, its main festivities commenced at night in early to mid-August with an impressive torch race which carried fire from the academy in the city center of Athens to the great altar of Athena on the Acropolis. The altar of Athena had already been piled up with logs and these logs were set on fire by the torch race victor. This was then followed by an all night celebration of women dancing and singing on the Acropolis. The festival, the celebration, commemorated the birth of their city's patron deity, Athena, and her decisive role in the cosmological battle of the giants. It was, however, by no means the only occasion of nocturnal rituals being held on the Acropolis. We have ancient sources that tell us of other times in the year when worshippers climbed up at night the steep Acropolis hill for religious performances. So this asserts the presence of visitors at night on the sacred rock. So let's go back to the Panathenaea. Um, the time of the year chosen for these nocturnal activities was during the most significant time in the annual movement of the constellation of Draco. Draco was connected in mythology with the festival of the Panathenaea and with Athena. Uh, and the reason why we know that is because the myth, the foundation, the myth um, that was associated with the festival um, talks about this cosmological battle of the giants. And during this, um, Athena gets born out of Zeus's head, fully armed, and she launches into the battle of the giants. So this battle marks the time of Athena's birth, the patron uh, deity of the city. And what is interesting is that these ancient sources that narrate this myth also tell us that the sun god, Helios, paused time as soon as Athena appeared out of Zeus's head so that Zeus could rejoice in her birth. Then time resumed and the battle between the Olympians and the giants continued. During this battle, Athena snatched a giant snake from the giants and tossed it over to the sky, forming thus the constellation of Draco. You can see the constellation, I don't know if you can see my cursor, um, is over here. And in ancient Greece, it was believed to be a giant snake in the night sky. Now, Draco was visible from the Acropolis. What you see on the screen, on the bottom half of the screen, is a reconstruction of the night sky at, on, at 500 BC from the Acropolis, uh, as, it would have seen, as it would have been seen by the participants of these festivals. So Draco was visible during the Panathenaea at this most significant movement in the year. The timing of the festival was on the last few days of the waning moon or on a moonless night. So this meant consistently dark nights with a particularly low moon luminosity during the Panathenaic celebrations. And this would have increased the visibility of Draco on the Athenian night sky during the moments when the participants would have been present on the Acropolis. During the day, the festival participants were reminded of the cosmological significance of these mythological events in the sculptural decoration of the Parthenon. 
So this um, cosmic moment of Athena's birth is depicted on the Parthenon Zeus pediment, which narrates the birth of Athena. In the center, you see Zeus and Athena being surrounded by the other gods. It's the time, it's the moment when Athena has just been born. But the importance of this scene is not at the center. It is on the two corners of the pediment. On the southeast corner, we see the sun god Helios in his chariot seen to rise above the waters of the ocean. And on the opposite corner, we see Selene, the moon, in her chariot, who has almost sunk below the pediment. The heads of the horses on her chariot with their open mouths and protruding nostrils are grasping for one last breath before they sink completely in the space below. So this is a moment when night turns to day and the composition creates a balanced center of an eternally rotating cosmos as the two contrasting heavenly siblings gravitate to either end of the, core, of the pediment. And the base of the pediment functions as a virtual horizon. Now, as a structure, the Parthenon frames um, the space of open air, nocturnal, and diurnal ritual performance. So the participants of the festivals would have arrived, again, I hope you can see my cursor, they would have arrived from here, from the Propylaea, the gates of the Acropolis, and they would have been guided towards the front uh, through this space that is, that is um, defined by the Parthenon and the older temple of Athena here. So they would have ended and they would have gathered around the altar of Athena over here and in front of the Parthenon. And this is the location on the Acropolis from where Draco would have been best observed. So the temple and its sculptural decoration function as a repository of collective memories through the cognitive blending of myth, space, and the cosmos. So let's move on to internal aspects of darkness in Greek monumental architecture. These examples are the most impactful and they arrive from sanctuaries that were related to the art of divination. So in ancient Greece, we have different methods of divination and each me method determined the architectural features and form of the temple. Now, very often divination required dreams or visions to be experienced. So required participants to be incubated and sleep inside uh, specific structures, not exactly the temples. So for example, we have healing sanctuaries, which required healing visitors uh, to see vision and to um, have a contact with the God who would be healing them. But also we have oracles of the dead, which required visions of the dead. Healing sanctuaries were a form of divination as the visitor had to spend several days in the sanctuary being treated and given a specific diet based on the health condition sought to be cured. When the patient was fully prepared, they were taken to specifically designated rooms where they waited for the healing God to appear in their sleep in the form of a dream or a vision and to cure them. Such incubation rooms have been securely identified um, at Asclepia, which are sanctuaries of Asclepios, at Corinth, Epidaurus, Pergamon, and Messini. What you see on the screen on the top uh, part is the tholos, a round structure that uh, was constructed at the sanctuary of Asclepius in Epidaurus. And what you see below the, the ground floor level is a set of meandric corridors and passages um, which were used in the process of healing. Ancient writers referred to this as the tomb of the god, and the descent of the patients to this underground structure was symbolic of descending to the dark passages of Hades in order to meet the god. Now, anticipation of a god in darkness 
could reach extreme measures in ancient Greece. And these were, in fact, aimed at um, having the visitor experience extreme sensory deprivation in order to detach the inquirer from the human world and to induce a unique and unexpected state of mind. An extreme such example was the Oracle of Trophonius, or you see a reconstruction of that on the screen, where inquirers had to descend and crawl into a narrow underground chamber at night and wait for hours or days for the vision or hearing to come to them in what is described even by ancient authors as a near-death experience. So architecture was the medium for achieving this near-death experience and complete sensory deprivation. Now, very intriguing in this respect is necromancy. Necromancy is divination through communication with the dead, which required several days of incubation where contact with the dead was sought. The contact with the dead uh, was considered by the ancient Greeks to be both polluting and dangerous. So the locations for the oracles were selected very carefully. Ancient descriptions of oracles of the dead say that they resemble the dark, gloomy landscape of the underworld. Water had to be in abundance, as it was rivers and lakes that separated the world of the living from the world of the dead. The Oracle of the Dead in Acheron was located in a marshy land with poplars and willows at the meeting point of three rivers, just as the ancients imagined the landscape of the entrance to the underworld to be. The Oracle of the Dead at Heraclea Pontica on the south coast of the Black Sea had an entrance to a cave leading down to an underground chamber through a stairway. Necromatic consultations commenced, obviously, long after sunset, ideally at full moon. The consultation involved several days of fasting, preparation and incubation in dark rooms with no windows, where the ghosts of the dead were anticipated. The seclusion of oracle seekers in dark chambers, where they also slept, was obligatory. So, it seems that the privilege of attaining secret knowledge could only be achieved in darkness and architecture made this contact possible. Unfortunately, only very few examples of oracles of the dead have been securely identified by archeologists and most of those date to later periods. And their architecture does not survive well enough in order to allow us an in-depth study of this practice. But ancient accounts, tell us that um, contact with the gods and especially the dead required a massive cognitive and sensorial leap achieved through strict fasting and immersion into extremely dark sensory deprived conditions. So the architectural form of these oracles was key to the success of the practice. So this psychological and physical preparation of consultants is also witnessed in a number of other types of oracles. These other type of oracles involve a lighter emotional manipulation, so not as strict as we have just seen. Uh, but here, the use of darkness was also decisive. The most notable examples were the oracles of Apollo. In two of his oracles that we will be discussing today, um, located in the west coast of Turkey, uh, we observe very interesting methods of creating light and dark conditions. So this was achieved inside the temple as the consultant transgressed through labyrinthine passages and narrow dark corridors. And the aim was clear, separation from the surrounding world. One of the most famous oracles of Apollo is um, the, his oracle at Clarus, which is the first one that we will explore today. Um, the existing temple uh, was constructed on the fourth century BC, but it was not completed until the second century AD after many years of interruption. 
So this temple was constructed on the remains of an earlier open air structure, which included a hypethral courtyard and a well. Now, once the cult went inside indoors with the construction of the existing temple, a game of perception started. Early sources, which predate the existing temple, mention that the seat of the oracle was in a cave. But by the time the temple was constructed over this space, the cave had gone underground. Oracular consultation of Claros took place only after dark. So firstly, the temple was constructed on two levels. This is unusual. Uh, we have the ground floor, which has, as you can see on the screen, the plan of a standard peripheral temple, and a second floor, the underground level. The consultation took place exclusively in the underground space, the crypt. The crypt was made up of two rooms and the internal courtyard that I spoke about before. The crypt stretches along the entire temple cellar, and the room that was accessed first was the so-called Hall of the Consultants. This was probably used as a waiting room for oracle seekers. The Hall of the Oracle was a room where the God's mouthpiece pronounced the prophecies from. So the source of the Oracle's inspiration, we are told, was the water of the well that was originally in the Hippethral courtyard, but subsequently inside the temple's crypt. This internal courtyard sinks three meters below the temple's ground floor level. The consultant entered the front gallery of the temple on the ground floor. And from there, he descended. And I'm talking about a he all the time. It's because only men were allowed to be consulting these oracles. So if a woman had a question for the oracle, she had to be entrusting the question to a man who would go and consult the oracle on her behalf. So the consultant would descend to the underground crypt from that front gallery in front of the uh, temple. Access points in the form of six steps were located close to the temple's pronos and they led underground to the crypt and corridors. This means that during the nocturnal consultations, oracle seekers with the right to enter the crypt, did not require access to the temple's interior. So from the front gallery, two symmetrical staircases led to corridors dressed in black marble. The extremely narrow width of these corridors would only fit two people across. So one corridor was used for entering the crypt and the other was used for exiting. This setup is also followed in the first room of the crypt, which has two doors. One would have been used to enter and the other to exit the space. The architecture of the narrow black marble corridors clearly aimed at enhancing a sense of mysticism and emotional intensity. And as, this, this, as, and as if this was not enough, the corridors had a meandric layout requiring the visitor to change direction seven times before arriving at the Hall of the Consultants. So this was a solitary process and experience, and it had a deliberate cognitive impact on the consultants who experienced an underground descent, disorientation, and sensory deprivation at once. So there's, uh, there was no natural way of illuminating or ventilating the crypt, and consultations then took place at night in a windowless underground cell under the light of torches or lamps. In addition to that, uh, indentations that were carved on the marble blocks of the arches that you see on the screen worked as mortises, mortises for fixing wooden pegs in order to support some sort of an installation that was uh, a sort of covering made by arched wooden panels or a fabric, so to form a sort of barrel vault. All these features would have been barely visible under torchlight and the low height of the crypt's barrel vault ceiling. But they 
no doubt influenced the consultant's experience by giving the impression of being inside an underground cave. So at Clarus, we observed techniques which mentally transported the oracle seeker to a cave environment in order to achieve communication with the god. Recent cognitive research on crucial factors determining human perception of dark spaces has much to offer to our understanding of this experience. The predictive processing model informs us about the workings of the human brain in light deprived and low sensory conditions. A modern experiment was carried out using a virtual reality model and it asked the participants to detect beings inhabiting a virtual forest when in reality there were no beings present. The experiment's aim was to monitor reactions of agents as a proxy for real life religious experience of the existence of supernatural beings. So the participants were exposed to the same forest in daylight and in dense mist um, instead of darkness because darkness can cause fear. Now, half of the participants were told that they had a 95% chance of encountering beings. And the other half were told that they only had a 5% chance. The results of this experiment demonstrated that, such, that in such conditions and when the agent expects it, they are, the human brain commonly imagines encounters with supernatural beings, especially in contexts of low sensory reliability, even when there is no actual presence. This false detection um, has been interpreted as strengthening religious beliefs. So the experiments basically confer, the experiment basically confirms the power of combining contact with the divine with low sensory conditions. And what we saw at Claros, from the moment the oracle seeker commenced his descent through the, through the windings of the narrow passages, this, his senses engaged intensively. The liminality of the dark space prepared his transition to a different consciousness which was a precondition for contact with the divine sphere. It is clear that the presence of, a, of the labyrinth and the underground structures were fundamental to the consultation. The intention was clearly a sensory experience and the flickering light of the torches or the lamps that were carried to show the way enhanced this experience. The human body, brain and mind engage with the surroundings using orientations, lines of sight and spatial movement in order to construct an understanding and interpretation of the cosmic structure and our place within it. The consultation procedure and the temple at Claros proved that the ancient Greeks were not only aware of these cognitive processes, but also that they used them with great success. So 100, meter, 100 kilometers away from the site of Claros that we have just discussed, along the west coast of Turkey is another celebrated oracle of Apollo, that of Didyma. And here again, a later temple that was constructed around 300 BC engulfed the remains of an earlier structure. The later temple's unique architecture was impressive and played with perception. It's an immense structure, which makes a strong visual spatial mark on the presence of the god in the landscape. But in fact, this structure is hollow. Externally, it looks like a dipteral temple on a seven-stepped platform. It had a 10 column width, um, so a 10 column wide facade, and it was 21 columns long. So the visitor had to climb the particularly high steps towards the center of the temple, only to find out that the main monumental entrance was blocked by a wall, which barred access to the temple's interior from the pronouns. This was unexpected. 
above the wall, a wide opening um, or a window allowed the visitor to get a glimpse of the inaccessible interior. Now, access to this structure was unexpectedly through sloping, very narrow, dark bar barrel vaulted passageways constructed in a space created between the wall of the pronouns and the temple's side wall on both sides. And I hope you can see it, um, my cursor again, it is over here. So each passageway was over 20 21 to 20 meters long and just over one meter wide. Each led laterally from either side of the pronouns down to the grassy floor of the temple's unroofed interior. These passages or tunnels could only admit one person at a time. This restricted space is in direct contrast with the enormous scale of the temple and plays clearly with the human perception of scale. You can see the passage at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. So visitors encountered an unusual God-sized threshold shrouded in darkness from the heavy shadows that were cast by the forest of the gigantic columns of the pronos and the prostai. And instead of entering the temple in the sort of conventional way, from the main entrance centered along the facade, they had to be moved and transported to this claustrophobic space, the vaulted passages, before arriving at the temple's ancient core, a sacred open air grove embellished with, small, with a small prostyle temple. The clever hollow Hel um, Hellenistic design allowed the temple's architects to create an imposing approach with an enormous visual and psychological impact of what was essentially an empty, unroofed cell. The structure allowed direct contact with the sky and so maintained the old uh, natural spring amidst trees that had long been considered the sacred source of the oracle's power, as well as leaving intact the ancient structure. The interior composition was open to the elements while being completely cut off from the outside world, thanks to the walls rising as high as 22 meters. So it is unfortunate that at Didyma, we don't know the time of the consultation when the consultation took place, but the temple shows clear intention to play with the visitor's sense of scale and trick expectations through the construction of the fake gigantic doorway. The narrow dark vaulted passageways, which would actually lead the visitors down to this level. You can see the exits over here. And the open space of the interior. Contrary to expectation, the interior was a living space, ever changing through its contact with the elements and natural light, creating a reflection and shadows during the course of the day and the seasons as the sun moved around it. Experience of architecture is reliant on time, motion and sensory perception. And at Didima, the impressive play with scales and alternations of light and darkness through the transitions must have intended to psychologically prepare the seekers for contact with Apollo. At the same time, these passages create, as we saw at Claros, a mental distance between human and divine spheres. So in the religious sphere, darkness shapes experience, both in modern and in ancient cultures. Leaving aside the impressive effects of the use of fire in nocturnal activities like torch races and processions, visually, darkness functions as the backdrop that allows revelations to inspire awe, focal points to stand out, spectacles to be appreciated. Darkness and the alternation of light and darkness have an indisputable impact on the emotions of the participants. 
Ultimately, in ancient Greek monumental architecture, the importance of darkness is twofold. First, the experience of these structures under external natural darkness during open air nocturnal festivals, which meant that the surrounding landscape was shrouded in darkness. This setting provided the backdrop against which the constellations and artificial light could be appreciated. In this context, darkness created the ideal conditions for the commemoration of star myths, linking thus the microcosm of the earth to the macrocosm of the universe. This enhanced ritual experience stimulated the participant's mind towards an understanding of the witnessing and participating cosmos in the ritual activities. It also facilitated a dialogue between the microcosm and the macrocosm and brought to life myths through a carefully timed movement of relevant constellations, which appeared during the key moments of the open air rituals. In other cases, staged interior darkness was intended to determine religious experience. This was most intensely experienced in oracular consultations when direct communication with the God was expected to be imminent. The use of darkness achieved intense psychological manipulation through labyrinthine passages, underground descents, and narrow vaults in ancient Greek divination. Oracular architecture required visitors to step down to the bowels of the religious structure. The connection with nature was important here, and it was asserted through the presence of groves. The association with nature is also witnessed in the attempt to imitate natural darkness similar to that that would be, have been found naturally in natural enclosed spaces like caves, for example. These elements were clearly aimed at altering the oracle seeker's frame of mind and perception, affecting cognition through low sensory conditions and inducing specific emotional state of mind in order to prepare the consultant for contact with the divine. This mechanism is witnessed in various oracular structures um, where intense use of darkness forced the participants to look inward. Cleverly constructed architecture confused visitors, tricked their senses, and ultimately convinced them that they had arrived at a sacred space where divinity was not only present, but also willing to communicate and reveal itself. So architectural form shapes space and along it shapes experience and perception. Through carefully staged architecture and precisely timed nocturnal performances, ritual present, presence and ritual experience reached immense sensorial heights in ancient Greece. It was the combination of architectural form and darkness that facilitated this experience of the supernatural. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for this uh, voyage into a realm where darkness um, was really a catalyst for other kinds of sensorial experiences, both divine visions and altered states of perception. Um, we will take a couple of questions from the audience. I will start with one question of my own. Um, Dr. Butsikas, do you, do you see in your practice um, kind of a, a nascent interest for uh, a dimension of a realm of knowledge that, as you said, traditionally has been consumed um, during the day. We've been presented with these structures during the daytime. We've been taught to appreciate them and study them during the daytime. What is your um, experience in the last years, especially when advocating for a more nocturnal appreciation and understanding of these spaces? Um, thank you. That's a really good question. And uh, absolutely, I think it's, 
it is we are so detached from these cultures and i'm not just talking about the ancient greek culture just any archaeological site so we are so detached from these cultures as it is um, the fact that we experience these spaces in all the wrong times doesn't all doesn't help our understanding and our contact uh, and our learning experience as well because visiting these spaces is a learning experience so i absolutely think that um, we, it is it is necessary to move towards trying to at least imitate the conditions, the temporal conditions that these spaces were intended for. Um, and it actually it's actually quite uh, consolidating to see that there have been various attempts, um, at least in archaeology uh, and classical archaeology, to accommodate this. So, for example, like uh, as many of you will know, you have already visited. Uh, Rome, um, the Pantheon in the Rome um, is available and open to the public at night time as well as in day. Um, in some cases, in ancient Greece, for example, some archaeological sites are open at night on a full moon in the summer, so visitors can walk up to these spaces to experience them for what they are. But also the, um, the development of 3D and virtual technology allows us to now be more, um, if you like, closer, a step closer to the recreation of these spaces. So virtual reality models, not they don't just recreate the temporal settings, but they also recreate the, uh, the ancient structures as they were constructed. So I think we are on the right track and there's attempts there to, that, to sort of help us um, experience these sites as they should be experienced. Uh, we still have a bit of a long way to go, uh, especially in terms of technology, um, and but also in terms of you know being able to visit these spaces at night. So we're getting there slowly. Thank you for that, and thank you for this comment on access, which is obviously a big issue. Um, I'm going to turn to the audience to see if there's a question. Well, Dr. Butsikas, unfortunately, everybody is still uh, entranced by your presentation, and therefore, there are no immediate questions. So I will take this opportunity to say thank you, uh, thank you. and thank you. to acknowledge that um, this understanding that darkness is a backdrop for revelation is something that should stick with us over the course of the next two days. And thank you also for pointing out to all of us that Apollo's oracle at Claros and the Bergein in Berlin are not so different after all. Right.